In this episode, we talk about applying a solder mask to your custom etched circuit boards, and we circle back on flying the race drone. So let's talk about drones. Last week we built this race drone and now it's time to go out and fly it. We configured it on the computer and there, you have to configure the ESCs, the flight controllers, the video, and get it all set up to how you like it in terms of a baseline. Once you get out and fly it and get a feel for it, then you'll tune it and adjust it to your likings. But before you get there, you have to realize that drones fly differently than fixed wing aircraft. Fixed wing aircraft, you're dealing with aileron rudders and the aerodynamics of the vehicle to manipulate the airstream and create lift. I mean, by doing so, you can glide and things like that. Not so the case with a drone. You're dealing with the thrust vector and you've got four different engines. Each of these engines can manipulate the aspect of the vehicle at any given time. And depending on which flight mode you're in, you have more or less control over those vectors. Something like the DJI Phantom Professional is a fully automated flight control system such that the receiver is really only providing the intent to the vehicle and the vehicle is responsible for performing that intent. And so as such, the DJI Phantom is a photographer drone. Um, something like this is the complete opposite. It's important to note that the flight control systems allow you to be in different modes. So DJI Phantoms in a fully automated flight control system. There's a mode called horizon mode which is more like a segue if you will. You can drive it but at the end of the day when you let go of the sticks it automatically stabilizes. You can push forward to go forward, back, left and right but if you let go of the sticks it's going to stabilize. That would be like a horizon mode. It's semi-automated flight control and it's good for learning but you become reliant on the fact that it's going to automatically stabilize for you. Most of the professionals and drone racers that you see out there doing the ridiculous stunts and have full manipulation control over their drone, they're using what's referred to as a rate mode or acro mode. Rate mode and acro mode is really dealing with the three axes that are for the flight vehicle. You have the yaw, which is your rotation. You have pitch, which is going to pitch you forward or backward. And then you have roll, which is left or right. The complex part is those axes change depending on the aspect of the the drone. So when it's perfectly flat, yaw may be like this. But if you pitch it forward, now yaw is at that plane. And so as you can imagine, if you're flying line of sight, you're quickly going to get confused what your yaw is going to do to the flight vehicle. Um, so FPV makes it a little bit easier because your aspect is always in relation to the perspective that you're seeing through the camera. That makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but this thing, let's be honest, this is a Lamborghini, man. This is 0 to 80 in less than 2 seconds. So and before we dive in and destroy destroy this thing, we went out and bought an Eachine Racer 250. Now this is something that's 150 bucks. It's relatively quick, but this is something that I wouldn't feel bad about destroying. So we took this out and we were getting our FPV practice in. But before we did that, we actually used Freerider on the computer. Freerider allows you to actually plug in your remote control into the computer and then practice the various uh, stabilization modes. So you can try horizon mode or you can try acro mode and get a sense for what it feels like when and you're in that control in a first person view perspective. So that definitely helped us acclimate ourselves. We're still using stabilized mode in this. Carson did really well driving this vehicle around in FPV. The Space One racer that was built, we took this out there and the first time I uh, fired it up out in the field, all right, so this is not gonna fly today. My minimum throttle in the flight control board was higher than the minimum throttle that the ESCs were programmed for. It hovered and levitated without any input from me. Fortunately, I'd set up fail safe and I killed the throttle and so the drone only got about 50 feet away from me. Took it back to the house, reconfigured it. Noob mistakes, right? So we figured that out, took it out flying and you'll see some of the footage of this going zero to 80 in. <laughs> less than two seconds. So in order to get the FPV view, we had to get goggles. These goggles are dual diversity goggles. Dual diversity just means that it has two receiving antennas and typically you would have different antennas on there, not the same type, uh, because one may receive better than the other. Uh, and what it does is it basically receives both signals from the same video transmitter in your drone and then it chooses which one has a better signal and merges them into the output that you see in your eyes so that it limits the amount of disruption or interference that you would typically see from the FPV by receiving two signals and merging them. And other than that, I think uh, you really have to ease into it and realize that there are different flight modes, but there are tools that allow you to figure out how to acclimate yourself to the characteristics of flying a drone using tools like Freerider on your computer. So, so check it out when you get a chance. All 
right, so a couple weeks ago we created this circuit board on the Nomad by etching it using the Gerber files that we produced from circuits.io. Um, so now we got the solder mask in the mill and what we're gonna do is gonna protect this, put a layer of solder mask on this and it will expose the solder pads where the components need to be soldered. If we don't have that, then it's typical that the solder will bleed over into traces where it shouldn't be and just cause problems for us. So we're gonna do that real quick. Process includes printing out the solder pads on a transparency, um, cutting a piece of the solder mask, heat applying it, exposing it to UV rays, cleaning off the area. It's pretty straightforward and it should make this thing look a lot better. Lucifer, son of the morning, I'm gonna chase you out of earth. <laughs> Alright, so we've converted the file to an image, we've inverted it, and then printed it out on transparencies. So I'm going to take these three transparencies, go over, cut them out, and glue them together, stack them up to create our negative for exposing the solder mask. Um, we've got the circuit board, the solder mask, and the stencil sandwiched between two pieces of glass and then clipped together with these binder clips. Take it outside. It's going to take about four minutes to expose in the sunlight. All right, so we brought this in after exposing it in the sun for three and a half minutes. We sat it in the darkness for about an hour. It needs that much time to cure the areas that were exposed to the UV rays. I mean, then once you're done, you put it in the sodium carbonate mix of water. Uh, it's 115 degrees and you just let it sit there for about a minute to two minutes while you brush it off. And all of the areas in the, the solder mask that were not exposed dissolve away. Um, and so that works pretty good. So now we have a solder mask on this board and we're able to start soldering components without fear of shorting out any of the other traces on the board. Um, so yeah, cool. I'll definitely use that again. The only problem I see with the dry film solder masks is it's only good for a, a few mils. So if you etch the circuit board too deep, you might get canyons and cavities that the solder mask has a difficulty adhering to. Um, and that could change depending on how you apply the solder mask. You're supposed to use a laminator um, to really roll and press it in there. I used an iron. Uh, it worked fairly well and I used a cloth on top of it to get some pressure down in those cavities. Um, but I would say not to overcut your circuit board when you're milling it on the Nomad. Go on the shallow side, just enough to get through the copper is really all you need and you'll have better results out of this. Now this worked, but I can see areas where it may not have the best adhesion under the solder mask and on some of the traces that it's covering. I mean, all in all, it's great. It's a prototype and it's gonna serve its purpose. <laughs> All right, so this was a bit of a weird week. This episode, we circled back on the drone. I wanted to show you guys they could actually fly, uh, but that's gonna be a learning process, and Carson and I are really enjoying the process of learning how to fly these things. But it is an amazing vehicle and is ridiculously fast. If you get the opportunity to go out and watch them fly or fly one yourself, it is so choice. I highly recommend it. That, in addition to getting back on track with the circuit board, we got the solder mask on there. We're gonna start actually plugging components in and then writing the software to make it all work. Um, so this is gonna get real exciting and fun real fast. So stay tuned in the upcoming episodes for some of that. Um, as always, have fun and stay safe. You flipped a U-turn there, it was pretty cool.